Hello everybody. Welcome to our Cake Foo Master Series. I am Amelia Carbine, your host. And um, today we have a really great um, trainer here with us. She's a really, really good friend of mine also. We had the, the nice opportunity of meeting each other in uh, Tulsa for the Oklahoma State Sugar Art Show. And the first year that I went, uh, Diane and I placed right next to each other. Um, and you know, in the top five together. So it was really fun, really uh, great experience. And so um, it, she's just a, an amazing person, wonderful personality, wonderful decorator. She's just all around amazing. So I am really excited to to announce uh, Diane Holgate today. Today. So welcome, Diane. Hello. How is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we're doing pretty well today. All right. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's start off with an introduction to you, Diane. I know that um, those of you that watched her first training um, should know quite a bit about Diane. But we'll um, we'll do it all over again because I'm sure that we have we have a lot more that are here that weren't here, you know, before. So um, I guess go ahead and. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> New stuff about me. <laughs> of course, there is. You know, one one being um, one being that you are the new IC's representative in New Mexico. You want to tell everybody about that and how that came about? Well, I actually kind of take over like March seventh, I believe, because then I will have been a member a year. I was, I've been actually a member for like ten years, but when I was sick. Um, nobody sought to renew my ICs, which is, you know, normal because we weren't thinking about that. And you yeah. have to be <laughs> a member in standing for a year. And when I was sick, and then I just didn't realize that, you know, it had expired. And then I just never renewed it for quite some time. And then oh. we had um, we got our newsletter, and it and it stated what everyone was running for, but nobody was running for state rep. And I just thought, well, I can do that. You know, that's not that big a deal. I can do that. Well, then come to find out, I couldn't do it because I hadn't been a member a year yet. So I renewed my membership, and um, it actually um, it actually takes place, you know, in March seventh. And Jerry DeCooster, who was the um, um, alternate, he has been running, but it's actually worked out really good because we've been working together for about the last six months or so kind of on a team type thing where he's teaching me, you know, and we're kind of overlapping, which is really oh, a good great. way for a president, you know, or I mean for the state rep to do that because then somebody's not just thrown in all at once not knowing what the yeah. heck they're doing. It's really nice that to have be done that. all the time. <laughs> have, have, have that nice six month overlap there where we can work together and 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 I can get my feet wet. So so anyway, that's how that came about. <laughs> that's great. Well, it, let's let everybody know, you know, a little bit about you and how you got started. Um, I know it, it's, you know, everybody has a different story on how they got started. Some are, you know, similar, but let's let's hear how you got started and and, you know, all about you. <laughs> um, I got started like a lot of people doing my children's birthday cakes. Is, is pretty much how it started. And then, you know, as my girls were growing up, I have three daughters, as they were growing up, you know, we would have a birthday party and the moms would be like, oh my gosh, where did you get that cake? It's so cute. And then, you know, I was, well, I made that cake. Oh my heck, will you make my child? Will you make my daughters? Will you make my sons? And so it just kind of went on from there. And I have, um, at the time I had, um, there were three of me and my sisters and my cousin, and we all had three girls. And mm -hmm. so and my sister-in-law had three girls. So there were four of us. We had 12 cousin girls growing up here in the same town. And so when the first one got married, I did her wedding cake. And then it just started from there. And I've always said that, you know, there, if there's 250 people at a wedding and the cake is beautiful and it tastes great, that's 250 people that are going to remember when they need a cake to ask mm -hmm. that bride or the mother of the bride or the bridesmaid or whoever um, who did the cake. 
Um, but also in re in reverse, if your cake is pretty nasty and it doesn't look very good, that's 250 people that will say, <laughs> oh, we are so not using her. <laughs> very true. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I I work pretty much strictly word of mouth. Um, I do have you know stuff on my Facebook page, and then I have a Cakes by Design Facebook page um, that I post things on occasionally, and. Um, not as often as I should, but occasionally. I'm better about my own personal page. <laughs> um, and, and so it just kind of goes from there, and people contact me um, through Facebook or, um, you know, I have a little magnet on the side of my van that I drive around with, and, and that's it. And I stay pretty busy. So, that's great. So that's, that's great. how I got started. Yeah, you know, I, I think word of mouth and, you know, just doing a really great job, you know. Your your work speaks for itself, and I think that really does make a big difference. So, uh, and you know, and around here, when I started doing cakes, you know, wedding cakes had a reputation of looking very beautiful, but tasting like crap. And I, uh -huh. I one woman show out to prove that wedding cakes can taste just as good as they look. <laughs> and and that's <laughs> And I've been teaching here as well. I used to teach at Hobby Lobby. I was a Milton, Wilton Method instructor. And then I started teaching for our community learning classes through San Juan College here in Farmington. And, um, and that has just really expanded. And I've, I've had two students go on to start their own cake businesses. And um, they do very well. They're, they're, they do wonderful cakes. And, and I'm very proud to say, you know, Patty Smith and Melody Ellis are two of my favorite students. <laughs> and awesome. then Mindy Garcia, that's great. Mindy Garcia, she's she moved to California and she's since moved back to Texas. And uh, um, I started teaching her. And when I got sick, um, and I was in the hospital for about I don't know eight weeks, she did um, the four wedding cakes that I was supposed to do. She did for me, which oh, that's I will. Name for that because of how a wonderful person she was to to step in when I needed help and of course I was you know laying in a coma not doing anything and she just she stepped in and and just you know took right over and so she's she's always been my hero for that <laughs> in helping me out so that is great well it, for those of for those of um, our listeners out there that haven't heard your your backstory could you want to explain a little bit of how uh, how that all worked out for you, your you know the the pneumonia, the you know all of that. Well, it's kind of crazy, but a short make it short. <laughs> um, in 2008, <laughs> I had ovarian cancer, and I went through three rounds of chemo, um, just enough to lose my hair, and um, which was actually wonderful because I figured out a few things about myself that. Even without hair, I'm, I was still me, and I could still, you know, do all kinds of stuff and, and still be happy. And then the next year, um, they think that my immune system was kind of compromised from the chemo, but also they really have exactly no idea what happened. I um, had a cough from just a cold, and I went into the doctor, and I said, I've got a wedding cake this weekend. I can't be sick. So they did a chest x-ray and everything was fine. They gave me some cough syrup and, you know, sent me on my way. Well, then that was on a Wednesday and I woke up Friday and I kind of had tunnel vision. I couldn't see and I couldn't think very clearly. Um, what they found out later was that my kidneys had already shut down. And um, I it went back to the same place. And it's actually where my husband works at Reliance Medical Group. I went back to the same place. They did another chest x-ray, and, and I was just full of pneumonia, and they, they put me in the ambulance, took me to the hospital, and um, somehow they don't know how it turned septic, which means it got into my bloodstream and, and all that kind of thing and basically put me in a coma. Um, and then what happens when, you're, when your organs start to shut down, all the oxygen and everything vital that you need goes to your major organs and it leaves your hands and your um, your legs, your extremities without oxygen. And basically what happened was my, my legs died, I guess is the way to say it. Um, 
and I almost lost my hands. And then when I was in my coma, they, they amputated my toes and part of my heel. Um, and then I was, finally was able to wake up enough and um, be awake for a few days. And then we just made the decision um, to go ahead and amputate below the knee because, I mean, it would be surgery after surgery and, um, you know, months in a wheelchair, maybe not even walking, and they would probably still have to end up amputating. And so I just took the shortcut and said, ah, let's just do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was just, and it, and it was actually the best thing because when they went in, they found that, um, you know, my legs were pretty pretty damaged. The the bones had fused. Um, the tissue was all black. Um, they did kind of have trouble saving my right leg below the knee. They they mm-hmm. tried and tried, and they they thought about amputating above the knee, which was great. I'm glad they did not. <laughs> so so anyway, yeah. so I am a double amputee below the knee, um, and my hands had some damage, but through physical therapy and actually kneading fondant was the best thing I could do was kneading fondant and squeezing a pastry bag because that um, strengthened my hands again and um, and so I can do cakes. So I have I do have one bum hand that kind of gives me some trouble but but it holds a pastry bag just perfect and it happens to be my, my right hand. So um, so anyway, so that that's that and then I've just worked at getting my cake business back to where it was going and worked on walking again and um and I, I have a lot of people tell me now that if they you know if they didn't know I was a double amputee they wouldn't be able to tell by the way I walk, you know, that I have two prosthetics. Mm-hmm. And I'm a Barbie collector yeah. and my prosthetics have Barbies on them. So that's my <laughs> <laughs> I love that about you. <laughs> I love and, that. And you, you know as far as legs. What was that? I said little kids are fun. They love to look, look at my legs. I, I go look to the school legs. when uh, Dawson Tell, the movie came out. I spoke at three of the elementary schools here and talked to kids about prosthetics and um, what they do and how they help people and, and stuff. So that was, that was really fun. I enjoyed doing that with the kids. That's great. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you are one of the most inspirational people I know. Uh, to to have gone through everything that you've gone through, and to you know still be here uh, even, and let alone to still be decorating and and just living your life the way that you you know that you normally would, and and just making your life as normal as you possibly can. I think that that is. That speaks so much for you because so many people could just give up at that point, and and you are just so strong, and, and I love you for that. That's it's amazing. Oh, thank um, you. You know, there's there's two things that I've learned. One, with the ovarian cancer, um, is that when and and this is my soapbox. When you go to get your Pap smear. All it checks for is cervical cancer. It does not check for ovarian cancer or uterine cancer. And a lot of women don't realize that. So um, my soapbox is make sure that when the doctor does his exam that he, you, know, you make sure you get everything. And if there is a question, get a CA-125. Most insurance won't um, cover it unless it's needed, you know, by the doctor, but I would go in and say, hey, <laughs> I need one. I need because it. Because <laughs> in that situation, it's basically the tumor marker for ovarian cancer, and then that way you will know and you can catch it early, which is what I did because of my mother. She had uterine cancer when she was about my same age. Um, and ovarian cancer mimics menopause. And so that's a lot of we- women don't understand that, and so that's why when they go in, you know, ovarian cancer is already a stage three or a stage four, and it's really hard at that point to to get a good prognosis. But mine was a stage one. And it was funny, two weeks after I got out of the hospital, I got my little card in the mail that said, woohoo, you don't have cervical cancer, (laughs) which I was like, oh, great. But I had uterine and ovarian, so. (laughs) (laughs) Get that checked. So, yes, definitely. I, I, my my other thing that is my main 
my main thing is, um, you know, crap happens. And you can stand there and cry because it's all over your shoe. Or you can wipe it on the grass and get on down the road. And my dad taught me that because he was a Utah farm boy. Um, and he's been a great example to that with me recently. But I'm also the same person with hair or without hair and with legs and without legs. And that is my, that's my thing, is you can, you can make the best of life and go on and, and fulfill your dreams and it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter what happens to you. You just have to have a positive attitude, I guess. And like I said, wipe it on the grass and get on down the road. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, for those of you that haven't seen Diane's work, we're going to get to see a little bit of what she does here in her, her training. Um, which is a really fun one, I think. Um, she's going to do some brushed embroidery, some painting on brushed embroidery, and show you guys how to um, how to keep it uh, for forever. So, um, I guess from here on out, Diana, I'll let you take over and and talk about what you've got here. Okay. Um, in this first slide, it's just basically a picture of some of my supplies. Um, you'll just need your favorite royal icing recipe. Um, and for brush embroidery, it's a good idea not to have it too stiff. Um, sometimes if it's too stiff, you don't get a, a beautiful pool with your brush. Um, and then just various petal dust colors, some luster dust colors. Um, I use some soft sable brushes, um, the Lau Cornell or whatever that brand is. I like those. Um, and they're round. Um, because I like the way the round ones work instead of the filberts, and then just, just different sizes. The bigger the project, of course, the bigger the brush that you will need. Um, but for tiny little things, you can use a two or a zero. And then for the um, larger areas, you can use a larger brush clear up to about a size four. Um, you'll also just need a bag with your couplers. I use tips one for small areas and tip two for the larger ones. And of course, if your design is bigger, then you'll need bigger tips. Um, you'll just need your water and whatever frame you want to do. And then a piece of cardboard cut the size that will fit inside your frame. Um, you can use a cake round covered in fondant um, for whatever color fondant you want to use. What I used for this project, I actually used watercolor um, paper, and it's a very stiff, Oh, what's it? It's like a very stiff cardboard. <laughs> Basically, is uh -huh. what it is, and, and uh, you can you cover like that. Cardstock? Yeah, it's like cardstock. Yeah, it's a little stiffer than cardstock. Um, but I just used the watercolor paper itself on this because I love the texture. And then as I was working on this project, I thought how cool it would be if I did fondant to. Um, um, take the watercolor paper and imprint the fondant with that and then let the fondant dry and then you would have a really cool texture on top of your royal icing to do your to do your brush embroidery. So I'm going to play around with that a little bit. That's cool. <laughs> the That's a good idea. For this um, project is most of us who are home bakers and we do show cakes, and they're absolutely beautiful. We know that they don't last forever. We also know that they take up tons of space. <laughs> and I, for a long while, I had cakes on top of my china cabinet. I had cakes on top of the armoire in one of the bedrooms. <laughs> I, you know, I had my big cakes everywhere, and I just thought, this is crazy. I don't have room for these things. And um, so besides having the pictures, I decided it would really be kind of cool to take the technique that I did on these cakes and do it and put it in a frame and then hang it on the wall. And then that way it's actually my sugar art displayed as art in my home, which um, I, I actually now have, have three or four pieces that, that I've done and one that I'm really, you know, that I'm working on that's, that's actually quite large. Um, but anyway, that, that's how this came about was to do some of those techniques and hang it on the wall. And then that way people could actually see the technique on my wall mm -hmm. as well as the photo album when I would sit down with the cake consult. So, so that's how I love, I love this idea. I just think it's, it's, it's perfect because 
like you said, any show cake or display cake is going to take a lot of space. And for all of the home bakers out there, you know, that's that's next to impossible to to do that much and and take up that much space in your home. And even even shops could do right. something like this and and use it for the artwork in the in the shop. I think this is just spectacular. So well, and Very. for this project, I did an open back frame, kind of like for an oil painting. It, there's no glass on this frame. Um, but for the one I did for my brown cake that was in the picture you saw that, you know, of me there at the beginning, I did that same technique. Um, I put that one under glass. So that one is under glass. You could also do, if you want to do, um, put some of your flowers uh, with your artwork to use shadow boxes. They have the shadow box frames that are actually quite deep, um, and you can put your flowers in with your shadow box too, which is which is kind of the one I've got my idea going um, for my daughter. I took the flowers that I made, my gum paste flowers that I made for her cake, and her wedding topper, and I put it in a glass dome, um, and that's great, except that it's always you're always in fear of it getting knocked off the the table or the top of the desk or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a frame and actually hanging it on your wall where it doesn't really get touched that much is a really good idea. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it uh, definitely I is. Good, so. All right. All righty. The first thing you want to do, and, and what I like to do is with my pattern, is first I like to color and decide what colors I want to use first because that helps you decide, and you can change it. You can make two or three patterns just by, you know, on your computer Xeroxing your pattern and color it two or three different ways to see which way you like it. Um, I also do it so that I know which way I want my brush strokes to go in my brush embroidery. Um, I know with simple flowers a lot of people will just pull right to the center, and that's great. But if you're doing something that's a little more um, challenging, you want to make sure your brush strokes are going the right way. So I color my project with the brush strokes the way I want them to go. I also number my petals um, and my leaves and things, like the big purple row, um, tulip right there in the middle. When you're doing a project like this, you do your back petals first. So I numbered those one and two. And then I did the side petals, three and four, and the petal right directly in the foreground, in the front, that's petal five. And that just tells me which one of those petals I want to do first. And then over on this big um, yellow flower on the side, I did the same way. You always want to do your back petals or your background first, and then move mm -hmm. forward in your design, because then that way you get some depth um, in, in your brush embroidery. If you do it on a color, you can leave it plain white. But if you, um, you, know, if you want to color it, that helps as, as well so that you know what's shaded in the back and what's not. So, mm -hmm. And so that's how this I set up my little, and my notes to myself, which, what I want to do back there. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. This is, this is great. I think that this right here will help so many people with their brushed embroidery. You know, because you know, where do you start? You know, what do you what do you do first, and how do you get the layers and and all of that? So this right here just lays it all out for you. That if you have this written down, all you have to do is refer back to this, kind of a right. almost a painting by numbers kind of a thing. So it's, it's, it's great. almost that's when I was making this pattern the other night. That's what I thought. I was like, oh, this is just like paint by numbers. This will be so easy, and it actually does <laughs> simplify. It simplifies so much, you know. And then the little filler flowers and the the leaves in the background, um, I usually do last because I want my big flowers completely dry before I go to do my little, um, you know, I did do the leaves behind the big yellow flower. I did those first before I did the yellow flower because I did want those in the background. But then those, uh -huh. those little, um, I guess they're like little black-eyed Susans um, in the pattern, those I did last. Yeah. Okay, oh, and the, and your stems are the very last thing you do, and those I just piped on with a large tip three. I just piped those on, and you, and you'll see when you get to that. Um, I just piped those on 
with a tip three so that they would be nice and round. I didn't brush embroidery those in. Okay. So. All right, so here's a little closer up of, of the picture. I, I you know blew it up a little bit so you guys can see the numbers, so you can see how you know how it all works. So so you say go from top to bottom and then um, the middle out. Right. When you're doing your brush embroidery, stop it. Start at your tallest flower. So I did the purple flower first, and then I did the leaves on either side of it, um, just like this picture shows. And then I did, you know, ground. And then I just started moving down. You just kind of go down, and then kind of move in. And that way, you're not basically what it's doing. You're not messing up, <laughs> you know. Um, uh -huh. what, you, what you've already done and you, you, know, you don't have a chance of putting your fingers or your arm or your sleeve or, or whatever into your project until it's completely dry. That's, that's um, very helpful because this is such a time-intensive you know, project that if you mm -hmm. mess it up, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and it's very frustrating. But if, if you'll notice in my supplies, I have my little tiny, very skinny, flat, um, um, oh shoot, what's it called? Well, it's like a spatula, but it's not a spatula. It's for oh. art. Oh, I had my palette knife. A palette knife, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I use the palette knife when I did make mistakes. If it's still damp enough, you can just kind of scrape it right off with your palette knife and start over um, because the brush embroidery will kind of hide it. So that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, good. That's great to know. Right. <laughs> This is it. It's all this one. It, now it's all done. I've done all the brush embroidery, and like I said, I've done the stems last, so that they're nice and round. And you can you can put veins inside the leaves if you'd like to. I did on this one because I wanted the leaves to be kind of prominent, so I did put some little veins inside the leaves. Mm -hmm. um, I did not for the tulips because tulips don't have you know a vein. I mean, they've got their little tiny veins coming down, but um, they're not prominent like a rose vein or, or these, these type of leaves. So I didn't do those for the tulip leaves. Okay. I noticed that your, your drawing is reversed from your, your actual brushed embroidery. How did you transfer your, your picture? Uh, what I do is I will take, I will take a pattern either something that I've drawn, or um, flowers out of magazines, um, or art instruction books. Those are fabulous because they have some great, you know, great patterns. Bob Ross or whatever his name is, he's one of my favorite. I will use some of his stuff, and I just translate that all to sugar instead of oil painting. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And so you can take those patterns, make a copy, and then I will use tracing paper, and I will trace the pattern the lines that I want. In this particular one, there were actually tons of other flowers behind it, and I didn't want that. I wanted it more simple. So I only traced the flowers that I wanted. Then I just take that tracing paper, turn it over on the other side, onto my project, and then trace the back. And it leaves a faint pencil line on your project. And that's fine because it's not on real cake. Um, on real cake, I will do it when the fondant is soft and use a stylus and just gently press if I'm doing it on a wedding cake. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can use the um, edible markers. Those are great um, to, to um, draw freehand on your cake. Um, but for this project, I just use pencil because it's going to be in a frame and not eaten. And so then it just leaves a faint little pencil mark. and um, and it worked great. So, um, and then you just, you know, when you take the the um, paper away, it just leaves that little mark. So, that's great. Great. Um, we have uh, Finn just commented on the chat. Um, this is something that I have learned also. The the number two uh, pencils are actually made out of graphite, which are non toxic. And so oh, it's huh. not technically an edible material, but it is not toxic. So right, um, and see, and there there are times I will use chalk on my on my brush embroidery or on some of my flowers. I will grind chalk because um, it, it 
if, if I can't find the petal dust color that I want, which petal dust is basically chalk, um, if I can't find it, I will use chalk. And I've always figured, you know, there are children chewing on pencils and eating chalk <laughs> all over the world. So if they can do it, it's probably non-toxic and you can do it on a cake or a project or something. It would yeah. be okay. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's but, definitely you know, something... Yeah, definitely something you you choose for yourself, but you know, justifying that it's non toxic, a lot of decorators are are okay with that because it is you know non toxic, and right. you know right. there are worse things going into our foods. <laughs> so <laughs> there are a lot worse things. Um, okay, this next bit is you just begin coloring um, with your light values first, and then move to the dark. It's very much like um, watercolors. If you paint with watercolors, you start with the light and go to the darkest color. Um, that's what I do. I will start with the faint yellow or purple or a faint pink. In in this in the orangey tulip, I used tangerine. I kind of wanted a, an orangey red. And so you start with the light colors and then and then move to the dark colors and shade them. Now on watercolor paper, it doesn't work well with chalk, and so that's why the, the tulip, the yellow, excuse me, I keep saying it's yellow, the purple tulip and the orangey red tulip have the highlights in the middle is because the chalk wouldn't go in. And that's perfect. That's the way you want it because it, it adds brightness, um, you know, to your design. The yellow, I wanted really highlighted the yellow. And so the edges and the shadows, of the yellow flowers are actually a red. Um, I, I started with yellow, I went darkening with orange, and then I darkened with red. With the purple tulip, I started with a very pale lavender, uh, I went to a medium purple, and then the very edges are done with just dark purple. And then the same way with the reddish tulip, I used an orangey tangerine um, I went to a kind of a dark pink, and then I did a red um, on the edge of the tulip. One thing that I learned in my color theory classes is to always use some of the other colors in anywhere in your project. So what you probably cannot see is that in the lightest highlighted section of the purple tulip, I used some yellow right along that edge. And then on um, the red tulip, I used some dark, dark red. And then on the yellow flower, I used some of the red. So what that does for your eye is it just kind of ties everything in together. Uh, I started the same way with my leaves. I started with a pale green. Um, I moved to a medium value green. And then I did a dark green. But also, I did some red, I did some blue, I did some yellow. I just kind of touched it in certain spots. And maybe in the finished slide, you'll be able to see that. But I, when I'm doing anything like that, I use all kinds of colors all over the place. And it just adds depth, dimension. It makes your eye, it's interesting for your eye to look at things like that. And it usually turns out pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, so what it is starting with the light value first and then moving to the dark. That's that's great information. You know, I, a lot of this is similar to um, doing actual three-dimensional flowers, it sounds like, because when right. you're doing right. those three-dimensional flowers, you want to layer on different colors and you want to add in contrasting colors to add that dimension and all of that. So so this this makes perfect sense to do it this way. Right, right. And um, and I and I see a comment from Cindy um, Yes, this is stunning. You, when you do it on black fondant, or or like my cake there, on you know at the very first slide, the picture of me on my cake there that I did was that that dark dark chocolate brown cake. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that was in Bride Magazine, and that one, um, it it's beautiful when you when you do when you do it on dark colors. Your brush and brush mm -hmm. is beautiful. Yeah, we'll be able to see that cake again once we get to the question and answer portion. So we can talk about how you did that on on that slide. I, I I know that there are some people that are very interested in that, and I've I've had questions of how did she do that. So <laughs> so yeah, that would be that would be great. And that still that still is like one of my favorite cakes. 
So um, here you can see where I've shaded in the darker areas. Uh huh. And you can see a little bit, you know, on that uh, that leaf off to the left, you can see the a little bit of red in there. You can see the, the mm -hmm. different colors. Right, right. And and I I don't know for some reason maybe it's just me and my little OCDness that you know I just I start coloring the same way possibly because what I've done first at the top is dry. <laughs> you know I know uh -huh. completely I'm not going to mess it up. Um, and royal icing dries fairly quickly, which is a blessing, you know. Um, yeah. But also, um, I, that's the way I start coloring things. I don't know why I just do that, but I do. <laughs> well, it works. It works well that way. So, <laughs> oh, and it says you add touches of gold. Um, right in the center of the little filler flowers um, is gold. They are gold. Uh, it, you know, instead of being like a black-eyed Susan, where it's, that, where it's got the big black center or whatever, uh -huh. um, partly because I didn't have black, but partly, <laughs> partly I wanted some gold. You know me. I think uh -huh. every time I've done the last, I don't know how many years, has gold on it. I don't know if that's my signature, <laughs> but I'm trying to move away from that, except that I really like what the gold does to brush embroidery. It just uh -huh. well, it's beautiful. Yeah, it does. It just it highlights it. It makes it sparkly, and it's very pretty. And and I knew the frame was going to be gold, um, and so I wanted to um, kind of tie in. And I don't know why I do this. That I do as well. But I just tie in the frame a little bit um, with because it was a gold frame, and I wanted some gold in there so that it would just be. And I'm a girl. I like sparkly things. So, <laughs> so I did this just, just center of those two flowers, and then the little flowers that go up across the top, they were gold, and that was it. That was all the gold I used. Okay. Well, it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, and there's, there's the finish. You can see the purple flower has a little touch of yellow right down uh -huh. in the center, and then right there on the, it would be my right-hand side, would be the right hand side in the picture, I guess. You can see a little bit of the yellow. You can see a little bit of the yellow also in that orangey tulip, and then the, the red, just a tiny bit. It kind of fades on the yellow flower, but you can see the gold there in the center uh -huh. there. And then, like yes, I said, that's the open, the open front frame that I, that I put in there. So. That's beautiful. So, on the, the leaves right there, um, oh. On the edges of the leaves, is that the yellow or is that gold? It, it's actually some blue and red. Oh, blue and, and red. Okay. Yeah, blue and red and yellow. There's a touch of orange down the center of the tulip flowers, um, and then kind of in this on the very tip. I also like to think if the sun were shining on this, where would the lightest parts be? And you can see on the tulip leaves closest to the tulip, it's, that would be where the sun has highlighted it, I guess, a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's also on the, on the leaf next to the yellow flower. You can see it's a lot lighter. And the, the leaf that is underneath that yellow flower, it is darker closest to the flower because uh -huh. it's that. So that's kind of how, how I do. I don't know. I like to just look and see if the sun is shining on my beautiful flowers. Where would it be? <laughs> So and so that's that's why I kind of like to highlight things like that and and stuff. So. Well, this is gorgeous, and you know you could you could do something like this, hang it in your living room, and what kind of conversation piece would that be? I mean, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, it would be, and and actually, I have had I have had actually some of my friends have commissioned my work so that they can hang it in their living room. And awesome. um, my chocolate cake I did for I did a, a little. Um, video of that, um, and my friend who was helping me video at the time, um, she's like, can I, because I did a couple, you know, I did two or three, and she was like, can I take this home with me? And I was like, sure, and she took it home, and 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 we we framed it, and it looks beautiful, and, and now she says, you know, it's on, I have one on one side of my shelf, and now I need another on the other side of my shelf, so I, <laughs> specific flowers she wants me to do and I just told her, okay, get me the flowers that you want me to do and I will, you know, and I will do some for her so that she can have a balanced whatever on her wall. So uh -huh. <laughs> that's great. 
<laughs> I used this to, is really I, I love Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby has great frames. And there was a someone asked here, where'd you get the frame? And and mm -hmm. Hobby Lobby has them. And I always wait for them to be fifty percent off, or I wait, you know, and use my forty percent off coupons. Um, but we have a Hobby Lobby here. Walmart doesn't carry as pretty of frames. Um, and they don't have as nice shadow boxes, things like that. Um, but here in Farmington, we have Hobby Lobby and Walmart, and so I, I go to Hobby Lobby. And yes, Michael does have Michael's have uh, nice frames as well. You can go to a frame shop a lot more expensive at a frame shop. Um, but also, the thing I like about our Hobby Lobby here, because I used to teach there, um, I know the guys that work in the in the framing department, and they will sometimes frame my things for me. So that I know they're dust free. They've got a beautiful back on them instead of just duct tape. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they will use them, and they know they know that my my stuff is made of sugar and it's very fragile and and that uh -huh. kind of thing. And they take really good care of my artwork when I have them frame it. So, um, so and they do a great job um, of, in the framing department here at our Hobby Lobby. So, um, so that's a perk. Um, but also. Um, one thing about this is I've I found with the other pieces that I've done is they don't fade. Um, once they're in the frame and they're sealed up nice and clean, they don't fade. Um, some of my cakes, you know, my my show cakes that are up on my armoire or wherever else, um, you know, they begin to fade and the gold begins to to kind of come off and that type of thing. Um, I've had my my dark framed brush embroidery for over a year now, and it has not faded because I had it sealed and framed nicely you know, at Hobby Lobby. And once it's done like that, I think it will last forever. Um, now, one I had on a dresser I did drop, and, it, <laughs> and because oh. the dries hard, it's pretty much shattered into quite a few pieces. And that one I just had to chuck. So I'm going to have to do another one, but um, but anyway, but it, it works pretty good. That's great. It's, it's beautiful, very beautiful. Okay, well, um, before we get on to our question and answer, I want to talk about Diane's recipe. This sounds so good, <laughs> and I mean even the the title of it, life changing apple pudding. <laughs> I think that just sounds great. <laughs> it's so easy, and it will change your life. It is so. Yummy! I could eat the whole pan, and it is actually my dad's absolute favorite. And he's been in the hospital pretty much off and on since Thanksgiving, and he's coming to stay at my house this afternoon. And I'm going to make this this evening for him because it's his favorite. It's an old-fashioned cake recipe, um, but it, it's it's actually very good. The sauce that you put on top of it will just knock your socks off. I put it on pancakes. Um, we dip our bacon in it. It's that sweet and salty, and it's very good. <laughs> so it sounds spectacular. It it sounds somewhat similar to a, a coffee cake that my mom used to make. So I I'm definitely going to give this a try. This sounds just spectacular. <laughs> and it's a very moist moist cake unless you overbake it. So try not to overbake it. But it is it's a it's it's an old fashioned. Pudding cake, basically, is what it is. So, um, so it's great. Awesome. It's, it's yeah. a good recipe. Well, and for uh, everybody that's in negative degree weather right now, <laughs> yes, this would be a good it, one. <laughs> and with the cinnamon and the nutmeg, it's a very fall-ish dessert, and and the fresh apples. I, that's usually when I make it. It's when apples are really yummy, you know, in the fall and the winter and. Uh, I grew up, we had 16 apple trees around my house when I grew up as a kid, and so we found ways, you know, to use apples, and we would just throw our apples, well, not throw them, but we would stack our apples in bushel baskets on the back porch and cover them with a big old huge tarp, and we had apples till spring, you know, when our apples, when our apple trees would start blooming and growing fresh new apples. So, so we, we, uh -huh. um, we found ways to use apples. So I did see on one of the comments someone asked about um, printing your pattern on edible paper. Um, you could probably do that. I think it would work well if that's a nice smooth sur surface. 
Um, and then another comment was, can this process be applied to crusting buttercream? Yes, I, I brush embroider my butter, buttercream all the time. Um, and I actually use buttercream to brush embroider with, but it's, very, it's thinned down quite a bit so it pools nicely. But yeah, you do have to make sure your buttercream is crusted and you have to be very, very gentle with your, with your brush embroidery. With your I, like, I, I would rather do it on fondant, um, but it can be done on buttercream. You just have to be super, super careful. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Um, for those of you that have asked questions in the chat box and, and we haven't seen them, um, go ahead and, and throw them up on the, on the top left side. It says, ask a question. Go ahead and ask your questions there, and we'll try and get to them that way. Um, and speaking of, I guess we'll start. Um, let's see, Denise Fox says, is this a seasonal technique? Can you do this in the summer when fondant cakes tend to sweat? Um, I've never had a fondant cake sweat. But, but then again, I don't refrigerate or freeze my cakes. And so there's no condensation when they come out of a refrigerator or a, a freezer, there's no condensation on them. So that would make a big difference if you freeze um, your cakes or put them in the refrigerator and they come out into the warmth. They might sweat some, but I don't, I don't do mine that way. So, yeah, I well, you know, I know that there there are issues in you know the more uh, moist areas of the country. I know you and I live in desert, <laughs> and it's not really an issue. But um, yeah, and and when you put a a cake in your refrigerator, if your refrigerator is moist, um, that could that could be a bit of an issue. I don't think it tends to be as much of an issue as some people make it out to be. Right. I don't. I don't. Like I, like you said, you know, we live in the dry area, so I don't know. I don't have experience with that, um, other than um, that would be like a natural thing for your cake to sweat, you know, if it comes out of the refrigerator and goes, you know, goes out on your table where your room is warmer, or or outside at a reception or something like that. I do know that that cakes will have a little bit of condensation and sweat, but with with the royal icing on the fondant, um, I wouldn't think it would be that big of a deal. You know, I don't think I don't think your royal icing would drip off. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as far as um, about uh, on the condensation subject, I know that we've had past trainers talk about the things that they do to prevent condensation in their refrigerators and in the summertime when it's you know, really hot. Um, one thing that they say, I don't remember who it is that said this, but they, they will box up their cake um, before they put it in the refrigerator and then they will actually wrap it in saran wrap also before they put it in the refrigerator. So any uh, moisture that might come from your refrigerator can't get to your cake. And so that uh, reduces the, the risk of condensation greatly. So I, right. that's, that's one thing that I would suggest that you do with something like this, you know, because you know, obviously royal icing doesn't do well with moisture. So, I mean, you, yeah. you do want to do, do your best to, to prevent the, the condensation from happening. But if you do get a little bit of condensation, I don't think it's going to be that big of an issue. Right. Well, and I, you know, because I do work from my home, I don't have, you know, a big refrigerator. That's why I don't refrigerate my stuff. I mean, you know, if I've got a, if I've got a wedding on Saturday, I bake on Thursday, decorate on Friday, and deliver on Saturday. So my cakes are 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 still pretty fresh, you know. Um, and and sometimes if it's a small cake, I bake it all and do it all on Friday and deliver Saturday. So I don't, um, and I don't usually have my fillings or things like that that. Uh, really need to be refrigerated. Um, in the summertime, you get really hot there in Vegas. We get pretty hot here in New Mexico. Um, I try not to use things that have egg in them, <laughs> you know, in the uh -huh. summertime as far as fillings go. So, and then I don't have yeah. to worry about that. But, uh, but being a home baker, there's a lot of things you, you have to think about. <laughs> 
Yes, well, I know that uh, I'm not familiar with a lot of the uh, cottage laws in, in other states, but I do know that in Utah, um, decorators, home decorators are not even allowed to make um, anything that is not shelf stable. So even fillings, you know, you, you cannot have a fresh fruit filling. You cannot have um, anything with uh, raw egg or anything like that. They, they really are very strict about the, the types of fillings and frostings and things like that that you can, can use. So, I mean, for, you know, I guess sometimes not refrigerating a cake is totally feasible because, you know, you don't have those perishable items in it. Right, and here in New Mexico, we have we have similar to that. Um, kind of one way I get around that a little bit is is if I've got you know a fresh strawberry filling, boy, that is the the very last cake that I do, and and because of our roads here, they're terrible. <laughs> anyway, uh-huh. I don't I, I don't ever transport my cakes already stacked. I take them in pieces and then stack them at the at the reception site, and so. The, you know, the cake with the fresh filling in it, that's the very last one I do. I put it in the car, we go, and then it, and it will, you know, sit for an, maybe an hour before the reception starts, and then, and then I, then I kind of don't have to, you know, worry about it too much. But if I do do one like that, then I do um, take it right there. That's the very last one I do. So, <laughs> you know, Sandy Swart just made a really smart comment, <laughs> which is really true. Um, she says, refrigerators and freezers are low humidity. It's the humidity in the air when you thaw it out where the condensation comes from. So, and I do remember that the person who talked about how they wrap up their cake to put it in the refrigerator, they actually bring it to room temperature before they even open up that box. Because, right. yeah, then, then the condensation can, you know, end up on the box mm-hmm. and not on the cake. So. Well, and depending on the size of the cake, sometimes it takes an hour at least, you know, for it to come to room temperature. You know, larger cakes a whole lot longer. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. So um, let's see. Jolene Christensen asks. Uh, she said, "Diane, are you familiar with a reverse buttercream method? Do you think your brushed art could be used in that way?" Um, basically, paint in reverse and then apply it to the fondant. Um, I I don't think with brush embroidery that you could do that and have it look the same, because with brush embroidery, when you lay down that little rope, and then you 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 start with your brush about halfway through that rope, a dampened brush, and you pull forward you leave a little rounded edge on the very outside of your brush embroidery. And that's what gives it a little bit of dimension. Um, If you try and do that in a reverse method, I don't think that you would be able to get that that little dimension. It would be too flat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And now, Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, you're you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna say I ha- I have done brush embroidery with chocolate before on a sheet of acetate and then turned it over and laid it on the cake only because I wanted a nice flat shiny side and mm-hmm. the little bumpy side where I brush embroidered it sticks perfect right into the buttercream <laughs> without having me to adhere you know having to use anything to adhere it with. But I don't know that it work, would work very well um, to do it the reverse way. Uh-huh. I've not tried it. Maybe that's something I will try and see. Um, yeah. But as I think about it, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're going for the effect that that you just showed, it's not you know recommended to do it that way because it, it would end up flat. You're right. Right. And I I love. Um, I, you know me, I'm a chocolate person. Chocolate is like my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> and on this, this is a crazy side note. I have always told my girls that if I am about to die, somebody better unwrap a chocolate kissy and put it in my mouth to melt <laughs> while I'm away. And when I was in the hospital, you know, I got I got close to you know dying a couple of times in the hospital, um, and I. 
after I woke up and I was coherent in the whole schmear, I, I was teasing my girls one day about a year later. I said, hey, by the way, did anybody unwrap a chocolate kissy and put one in my mouth? And they were just <laughs> flabbergasted. Mother, that is not funny. Besides, <laughs> you had too many tubes down your throat. And I was like, oh, okay, just check it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was, it was just one of those crazy things I was teasing my daughters about. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but I but I do love to I do love to um, play around with chocolate, and I have tried brush embroidery. Um, you kind of have to keep. Um, I have a warming tray where I keep my chocolate, and I keep my brushes on the warming tray. So number one, they're warm, and number two, the chocolate stays warm. And you do have to be very careful and work very quickly because your chocolate sets up very quickly. So, mm -hmm. but but I, I do love. Before, I before we move on, can can we talk about your cake that's in this picture? Because I know that there are a lot of people interested in how you do it on black. So, um, I, of course, it was white royal icing. This technique, um, when I when I went back in the day when toll painting was all the rage. Um, I took a couple of classes and I, and I taught myself the Zostovo style of painting. And back in the day when our grandmothers and our mothers used to have those metal TV trays that had the pretty flowers painted on them, that was the style of painting. It's called Zostovo. And that's what I did on those flowers. Um, and actually with those you want to keep the center dark and the very outside very light. And that's what I that so I kind of reversed that technique on this cake. Um, um, and so that's why everything is so dark in the middle and then lighter on the outside. So I kind of did a reverse a reverse shading on this cake. But yes, this is this is a really actually I started with a dark brown fondant and added black to it um, to get it very dark. But it's not completely black. You could use black fondant, I suppose. But I kind of like the the really dark, dark chocolate brown of this cake. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, well, this and was I, such a spectacular cake. I love it. Yeah, uh, I do remember that one of the judges telling me that it was it was hard for them to judge because every time they would stand up to scan the room, there was that dark cake. Um, and they, I can't remember, oh gosh, I can't remember her name, but she told me, she said her eye was just drawn to my cake every time she stood up and would scan the room or, or whatever to get moved to another cake, she would see this dark cake. Um, and it's true, I was very scared. I dreamed this cake, which I do a lot. I don't know if other people do that. I dream cake. <laughs> and I dream in color. Um, but I dreamed this cake dark, and I thought, oh, no, I can't do a dark black wedding cake. There's no way. People won't like it. It'll be too weird. And so I tried. I started out doing it in kind of a blue, and, and it just it, the effect was totally wrong. It just did not look right. So I started over and did it in the dark, and I'm so glad I did. <laughs> it is so, spectacular. Because I, you know, I, I don't know if it would have been as eye-catching if I had done it in blue, mm -hmm. but I really like it. It wouldn't have. It wouldn't have. This cake was, it was an amazing cake. It, to see this in person, you guys, is, yeah, amazing. <laughs> a very amazing. All um, right. And so, about your cake that you did that same year with, with your love letters and things, how wonderful it would be if you still had those love letters. You could put them in a shadow box uh, with some of those flowers yeah. you did. Mm -hmm. so I, I just, don't still have them throughout our moves. They all got wrecked. So, so <laughs> very, darn it. It's, very sad. It. But yeah. you could eat one or two and put a flower in there and, and put them in a shadow box just to remember. Exactly, I, think. I could. I could. And maybe I will do that now Now that I know, what, you know, do some <laughs> of the the shadow stenciling that I did and the, you know, brush mm -hmm. embroidery and the, ah, uh, that would be fun. I'm, I'm going to have yep. to go do that. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're out of time. I I appreciate the questions that everybody had. Um, let's see what's coming up for Diane. Uh, the one thing that you wanted everybody to know about was the day of sharing in New Mexico. So anybody that's gonna be around at that time or wants to come, you know, it should be a great event. You want to talk about that just a little bit? Um, I'm I'm super excited because number one, I will be 
the state ice is rep by then, um, but this has kind of been my little baby. We haven't had one for for several years here in New Mexico, and our our chapter is quite small. We are in the the northwest corner, so we're in the four corners. So I'm inviting anybody in the lower half of Utah or Colorado or Arizona to to come to our day of sharing. You're more than welcome to, and you can find information on my um, on our ICES New Mexico chapter Facebook or on my Facebook pages. Um, and if you want to register, you can email me, and I will send you a registration form. But um, we have Adam Starkey and Ted Scuddy. They are the show directors for the 2014 ICES convention in Albuquerque. Um, and they are going to come and demo Sugar Gems. And then we're going to kick it up a notch with Ramona Holton, who is going to let us um, actually blow some sugar bubbles and play with that. Um, then I am going to demo this project a little smaller, in a little smaller version, and it will be kind of a hands-on project. And then we have Jerry DeCuster, our, our, state, our acting state rep now. He is going to teach chocolate truffles. And so um, it is going to be a fun day. We are going to open it up to the public in the morning. Um, we have some foods classes at the two local high schools here that are um, hopefully we will get them to come. And um, we have a, a lot of people I am sending out personal invitations to, a lot of um, people in the area who do cakes and who are interested in that kind of thing um, to come. And then that way they can talk to the sugar artists that are coming from New Mexico to bring their, to bring their cakes and their work. And I, um, I have two cakes in my mask from last year that I will set up. And um, So we are calling that our cake walk. I guess we're having a cake walk, and, and that will be open to the public, and then we'll have a lunch meeting, and then we will have um, uh, our demos. So it should be a really fun day, and, and also on our Facebook page, I'm going to start listing a few things that you can do in this area. We have the Silverton train, we have Mesa Verde, uh, it's, uh, Indian Ruins, the Anasazi Indians. We have that real close in Colorado. Uh, Durango is 40 minutes away. Um, Chaco Canyon is 40 minutes away. We have a lot of neat things to do around here, so I will be putting that on there too. That so sounds great. Mix of it if they want. <laughs> so it should be real fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So go um, look up uh, the New Mexico chapter of ICES on Facebook, and you can uh, talk to Diane there. And she also has her email address here that you guys can email her if you decide you want to go to that. So uh, thank you so much, Diane, for coming and sharing this with us. I, a lot of really good feedback already, so <laughs> that's good news. Um, and thank you guys so much for, for joining us on our, our Cake Food trainings. Um, yeah, thank we you. Have, we have you know, quite the fun following, and, and we appreciate all of you guys. So. All right, I guess we will uh, see you guys all next week, and thanks again. Bye. All right. See ya. <laughs>